All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back again to the UPOW podcast, your source of motivation, inspiration, and information on your pursuit of wellness. I'm Sean. I'm Austin. And we have a very special guest, my sister, Maddie Lee, here with us today. I'm very excited to dive into psychology, neurology, and handwriting. All that and more coming up next on the UPOW right. podcast. Oh, what's up, Maddie Lee? This is How so you- cool. You like it? Yeah, it looks official. Oh, thanks. We tried. Is, it took a lot. Of, it took a lot of effort. So this is gonna be really tough to have this whole interview with you and not move my hands. Okay. Well, I'm currently sitting time. on them. Okay. Well, really? no. It's this is go live. This is real. Yeah. <laughs> Where are we recording? Uh oh, I'm official. You're official, Maddie Lee. Well, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I guess I was thinking about, because I'm not even sure what we're going to be talking about, which is kind of fun. So I was hoping it would be more of just a, a conversation because yeah. I am uh, i don't think I'm too qualified to talk about much, but I know a little bit about a few things. So As I guess that's all someone who has perused right. your LinkedIn profile, I'm going to disagree with you, but okay. <laughs> yeah. That's like you're well, saying you're not smart. <laughs> I guess oh, it's better to start calendar. off that way. And then if things don't go well, then I warned you. But if Put everything's all line. right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Set the bar okay, low. Um, well, let's see. So my name is Maddie Lee. Um, I was born and raised in Greenfield, Indiana. I went to Indiana University and got my Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience and Psychology. Um, right now, I'm a first year grad student uh, working at Vanderbilt under the supervision of Dr. Dan Levin. I'm primarily focusing on event perception and various aspects of just cognition and perception in general. Previously, I worked with Karen James at Indiana University studying handwriting and gestures. So oh. that's about it. Um, yeah, that's that's the only inter- interesting thing that I have to say. I mean, I think that's still some pretty interesting stuff. <laughs> you know, I said something really awesome, and then you were like, "Yeah, that's it. No big deal." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I guess like take us back. Like, what got you interested in neuroscience? Okay. What sparked that passion? Right. I know that's such a tough question because. I don't want to say, I I felt like it was a path I had always been interested in and I just followed it. Um, I don't think there was really a big moment where I was like, oh, this is my dream. Um, It was in high school, we were taking an anatomy class and we were talking about the brain. And I just felt like thinking about this organism having just this what three to five pound piece of meat in our heads that defines who we are I'm like why wouldn't I want to know more about that um and so I I decided just to pursue it and I didn't I mean that's really all that there is to it I went to uh, undergrad and I just felt like that was the one thing I was really interested in not just uh academically but something I kept finding myself doing naturally like looking things up online watching youtube videos about neuroscience or psychology and so i just kept with it um i don't know it's weird because i felt like there wasn't a huge defining moment but it's just i had never felt so interested in something other than the brain so i felt like it was what i had to do okay so was there was there like a particular topic you know perception because I remember I remember going to your to room one time and you were talking about how this lady could see things like she could see through the sidewalk because she controlled her perception so well that eventually she just lost it Mm -hmm. and I think it's pretty cool that you know our, our brains are that powerful that they can control the reality that we perceive too so I guess I'm just kind of curious on like was there a particular topic or direction that, that gets you excited or like what you're going to write your thesis on or study for your PhD? Right. Uh, 
Yeah. I don't know. The the hard thing is I feel like I'm still figuring out what my niche is, Mm -hmm. but what has kept me going is almost this weird mix of neuroscience and psychology tied into philosophy. So I felt like naturally I found myself really weirdly interested in these kind of um, theoretical and complex questions like what makes us us and yeah and then it's hard because I was so interested in that but I felt so naive because I'm like how am I supposed to even go about these questions Mm -hmm. and there's uh philosophers that'll write on and on and on about these questions but I felt like what I was meant to do is really get into the lab and I can't ask just as my thesis what makes us us I have to think of something super specific and that's what got me to perception because you can think of perception as um for example vision we're taking snapshots of the world but that's not it at all. We're not really getting true reality. We're interpreting the world around us into how we perceive our own reality. And so I felt like perception and particularly event perception was kind of a doorway for me to investigate these philosophical questions. Um, And so they're kind of very different, but they lean on each other in an interesting way. Yeah, for sure. It's like... And kind of that philosophy, it's just, you'll never be able to answer that question in a philosophical manner. Like, what is love? You know, what, what is that? Or, you know, what, why are we alive or, or something like that? But you can kind of go down and get even deeper into that question, start defining what those words mean and then make a hypothesis about it which is really cool because then you can actually study it, which you're taking like this spiritual, you know, philosophical area and you're trying to make it come into science and combine the two, which is is really pretty cool. Yeah. And I felt like I would be super overwhelmed with those questions as a kid Mm -hmm. too. And so now it's making me actually think about it. That's probably what made me lean more into science because it was really overwhelming thinking about these huge questions that are really important, but I felt like science could be a tool to investigate these questions and actually not answer them, but come up with potential solutions. Um, And, and, and I don't know, I, I mean, philosophers are amazing and very impressive. I couldn't do what they do, but it just didn't seem like the solution for me, I guess. Okay. I gotcha. So I guess, kind of flipping it on its head was there like a particular question that or a particular like philosopher or a book that sparked your curiosity and kind of sparked that what I guess that was the catalyst for you to go into neuroscience yeah that's interesting I feel like starting off there wasn't a particular question I think I think if I were to come up with one it would probably be something to do with how are we all experiencing the same things, but not really experiencing the same Mm -hmm. things. We're all experiencing the same things, but we're not having the same experiences. And that always puzzled me because it's like, even us right now, we're all kind of in the same conversation, but we have potentially different goals in mind, different thoughts, et cetera. And I think that leads into another big question that guided me is what's called the mind brain problem. So really Mm -hmm. how, how much of it is your mind, which mind is kind of more of a a philosophical aspect. So then there's the brain. So what does the brain do? And then what parts doesn't the brain do? What parts is left to the mind? And that's something that philosophers argue over on and on. But I felt like that was a, a really interesting question because I don't know. Um, you just, for me, I just sit there and I'm like, everyone is having such different experiences. And I feel yeah. like that's a question that kind of is contained in that. So, okay. So I want to get this right. Like the, what's the, so the mind is what again, and what is the brain? And could you so give me an example for each you know one? What's funny is before you actually answer this, that was actually a PhD qual question from Joel Steger back in the day like the most broad damn thing he could think of like what's the mind what's the brain right seven pages 
<laughs> oh my gosh, that sounds. That was horrible. for that was for a human performance PhD. Oh wow. Whoa. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'm the right person to speak on this, but basically, how I think of it is the brain is just con- it consists of a th- ten billion neurons. So mm-hmm. that's what the brain is. Okay. It, it, there's structure. There's cells. Um, it, it's physical, and then the mind is what's not physical. Ah. So kind of saying like. Well, if the personal if personality comes from the brain, where is it? And you can't really point to it. So then some argue that's the mind, something that comes out from the brain, but isn't the brain. And so go ahead. I was going to say, so it's like your subconscious in a way. Yeah, in a sense. So and I mean, your subconscious is utilized in various ways for attention, perception. There's a lot that you do that you're not conscious of. But thinking of various aspects of your subconscious, yes, that that's the mind. Okay. Wow. Well, and and then the mind kind of to go into event perception, it does these like tricks on you to bring up emotions or feelings or reality that has these like checks of reality, but they're not real. Like the only thing that we have that's real is the physical world. Mm -hmm. Like I could be like, I'm upset. So this means that that's my indicator for, you know, I'm upset with my sister and this is how I'm perceiving things, but there's nothing, not even in language does this event perception create. It's like what animals live in like their own reality. And we just like create these games on top of it, which (laughs) is just, I I don't even know how you study that because there's so many layers to it. Exactly. And that could be a whole different topic in and of itself. And that's what kind of overwhelmed me first getting in to this program, because it's like, there's so many different things you have to think about because Mm -hmm. The brain, and this is probably a topic that you've talked about before, the brain isn't even isolated from everything else, but the brain has a whole entire body attached to it. And so there's so many levels to it. So it's like you're studying something and you can get overwhelmed by the fact of thinking, what did they do that day? What did they eat that day? What are they thinking right now? What type of situations are they in? What's their socioeconomic status? What's What culture are they from? And there's all these variables and you kind of just have to ignore them and assume that statistics and randomization will be your friend and help you out and not be in the way of things. Because you can just go on and on and on about Mm -hmm. all these things you should worry about, but you can never create the perfect experiment. And so in that sense, there's, there are so many aspects that can probably conflate some results or hide some results, but you just have to do the best you can. That's all you can do. Sean, what do you think about that? I was going to say, I was just, I was holding out because all my questions are going to be like 85 layers deep. So I was trying to (laughs) let you, you know, kind of, kind of run your stuff. Austin. Um, so Maddie, I, I was going to say, I, I know, you know, you're, you're my best friend, sister and everything, but I know you and I haven't chatted that much over the years. So I, I'd hate to group us into the same group, but I'm a big formal education guy. I know, I know you're big on formal education as well, going into a PhD. I actually started a PhD before I got bored and went into an MBA because um, I'm a crazy person. Um, <laughs> but in, in looking at, um, I guess the... I've got so many questions that I don't even know where to really know where to start. So in, in talking about perception, that's what we've been talking about. Um, you're talking about your, your reality being the representation of your perception of external factors. And, you know, you even mentioned socioeconomic status and all these other things. Um, w- would you be, would you be willing to call that sort of exteroception and, and sort of, you know, the external and your perception of, that and how it shapes things. But, you know, I, I bring this up because I, I had a PhD student that used to work for me who actually went off to study interoception and study the perception of your own body and your feelings of it. Because along this physiology rabbit hole that we've all been going down, um, she found out that she didn't believe in the performance and the external factors that go into performance, but rather she believed in your internal perception of those factors was more important. 
So it wasn't that you did five sets, 10 reps, or, you know, you ran a hundred yards, you did this. It was how you felt about all those workouts and your body's adaptation to it. So interoception was sort of the higher level of physiological ad adaptations with the mind. And that's why she started to do that. So I, I guess I said all that 45 minute conversation there too. Uh, I guess ask you, how do you feel about the internal side of things? You know, cause I'm, I'm a big guy when it comes to, I, I really believe that your mind is very, very powerful. I mean, it's the most powerful thing you have. And I think the mind can, you know, even ward off illnesses and get you back from injury faster. And, you, and, you know, it, it can overwrite some of these other processes. And if, if you have true belief in what it is, you know, and I guess I wanted you to sort of, expand on that a little bit or, or tell me I'm crazy, you know, one or the other. No, I totally get that. And I feel like it, you can respond to that in a, bu a bunch of different kind of circumstances. I guess when I think of working out, for example, it reminds me of a conversation I listened to recently where it was this Olympic Olympic trainer. And basically they were saying that they don't look at all the data they just ignore it. They only listen to what, what they feel inside. And I feel like that's very valuable in a sense, because you can get really overwhelmed with like, this is what I should do. This is what I got to eat. This is what I got to, how much I got to sleep, all these things. But that's for everyone on average. Like, what do you need specifically? So I feel like you're right. And I feel like it's a good balance because it's important to listen to what's inside. And I, and I personally feel like that's what I would lean into more, honestly, because there's a lot of external factors and you kind of have to, you have to deal with them. You have to understand that there there's consequences like socioeconomic status. There's various aspects that are going to play a role in your personality, how you think, how you perceive the world in general. But what we found is everything is very malleable. The brain is super malleable, especially as a kid, but even now it's called neuroplasticity. And there's various things that you can do to maintain neuroplasticity. And, and that's why we're still able to pick up a new language, pick up a new hobby. Um, it, it's just, I don't know. I feel like it's a balance. Okay. So you I guess like, like it takes a, or go ahead. I was just going to ask like, while we're on that topic, like how can you maintain that? Neuroplasticity. Yeah, so um, it they the study that I'm speaking on actually comes from mice, but what they found to increase neuroplasticity are a few things. One, exercise, believe it or not. Okay. Two, it's your environment. You need constant change, and that's why I can think of a few people <laughs> that I know of that don't have constant change in yeah. their surroundings. But you can, I almost feel like I could feel my brain going numb if I don't have any sort of stimulation in my, my environment. And for mm -hmm. the mice, it was either a bigger space, different um, toys or wheels or et cetera. It's just, it, that one blew my mind the most. And it seems so obvious, but um, yeah. I don't know. It's not intuitive, I guess. So it's exercise environment and socialization wow and that's crazy. yeah and they i mean that's on mice but i feel like all of those factors are extremely relevant to humans as well so i i they've extrapolated it to apply to humans and i believe it because i feel like those three things they make such a difference for me and thinking about where we're at right now with the pandemic it mm. worries me for some people because it's just super important. And I feel like some people are maybe doing the opposite of neuroplasticity. They're, yeah. they're damaging themselves in various ways, but yeah, yeah it's not, interesting. Not exercising or, or even changing their space at all. Cause I like, for me, when I was in New York, the amount of socialization, the amount of constant change and constant feedback from your environment and then just walking as much as I did, I felt like I constantly could pick up and learned and improved my social skills uh, and a variety of different skills just on the fly. Like it wasn't like I had to consciously put effort into it. And now being back in a, you know, Greenfield, Indiana, it, I have to struggle to get, to make change in my own environment where it's so static. And right. I like it, it makes sense because what's inside, you know, your brain 
is reflected to what's outside. So if you have that constant change on, on what's outside, it's also going to reflect inward and going to be that constant change that's inward as well, which is, uh, which, you know, which is really pretty cool. Like, I, like they talk about that spiritually a lot of times, just like allowing change to be constant all the time and not resisting it. But then to, to hear that from somebody that's studying neuroscience, it's like, wow, that, that, that makes sense. Like <laughs> rather than yeah. just like a philosophical standpoint. Yeah. And I, I wish I remember the quote, but it's like, I don't know. I think it's something like, um, doing a lot is really hard but doing nothing is hard too. So which hard do you want? You know what I mean? And that's, <laughs> yes. that's, that's just so, so true yeah. to me because it's like, regardless, it, it's going to suck, but you want the suck that's going to get you further. So you yeah. need that strain. You need that change. You need that stimulation. And sometimes it doesn't feel good, but I guess this brings you back us back to interoception too. Sometimes it may not feel like feel good but you know long term it's what you need mm -hmm. and so i i don't know i feel like that's a interesting way to put it it's uh it's really interesting because there's this uh philosopher krishnamurti who says when you follow pain you also find pleasure and vice versa and I think you can find that in weightlifting, you know, you, you tackle pain to get pleasure to, you know, appreciate how your body looks or like to have improved in bo a body, or you can do vice versa where, you know, you might drink on Friday or Saturday, and then you have that <laughs> pain of a hangover on <laughs> yeah. Saturday or Sunday. And you're like, okay, yeah, that's, it's, I don't know. It's, uh, it's very interesting. What, what do you yeah, think? Yeah. Pain, Betty? It's true. How do I feel about it? Yeah, like, like what do you, cause like, uh, you know, kind of like Austin said, you know, with weightlifting and, you know, again, like I'm, I'm probably kooky when it comes to the, like my bodybuilding theories, but like, you know, I, I really think that some of life's greatest lessons can be learned through pain. Like, mm -hmm. like for example, anecdotally with myself, like I, I have, um, you know, a, a few herniated discs and I have one of them that deteriorated and I'm, I'm bone on bone on my L5 S1 disc and or my L5 S1 joint. Um, and literally, Literally, like that pain has taught me to deal with other things that would normally be very painful, but I'm like, well, you know, it's not as bad as this, so it's not going to bother me. And, and I, I attribute, you know, how having it a little, a little rougher growing up as well to that same thing. You know, I feel like a lot of things that should break me and should kind of hold me back just don't, they just don't bother me, you know? Oh, so I, I, I attribute pain as, as one of my greatest teachers, you know? So I, I guess it'd, it'd be interesting to hear from your point of view. That's really cool that I, I like that a lot. And I believe it as well. I mean, kind of back to what I was saying, I feel like you need that strain to grow. And I feel like science shows that as well. But I don't know, I think the strongest people have been through pain, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally. And it's not like you want that story, not like you want to have this background story, but I really feel like the deepest people do have some sort of story to tell. Yeah. And I think pain is part of life and trying to go through life without pain. I don't know. I don't think it's possible. And I, I, and I personally feel like you might not have the right perspectives because I've always thought of it as a sense that it's human nature for us to look for problems. When you have it so easy, your problems are the most pathetic problems in the world. That's when you're going to get upset about <laughs> first world problems. <laughs> traffic, traffic. Yeah, you're going to get upset that you didn't they didn't get your meal right at McDonald's, things like that. But when you've been through real pain, it gives you more of a perspective. And I mm -hmm. feel like that's a game changer and it can make you a much better person. Yeah. I agree it, completely, you know, because I mean, it, you, you just don't get held back by other things, you know, it's, it's like fear almost becomes a byproduct, you know, I mean, that, I mean, Austin, you know, this, like, I mean, you're in, you're kind of the same way as like, like, I want all the smoke, like bring me the adversity and make me feel alive, you know, like that, that's how I roll, you know, because I mean, it's yeah. like, those things that would be, they seem insurmountable. They're just not, you know, and, and I mean, it goes back to perception, just like you were saying, that's why it's such a cool, it's a cool thing to have you on to be able to talk about this stuff. Yeah. It, well, and I think it's cool too, because you, <clears throat> I think that pain brings awareness and it brings you to life. 
which is pretty cool. Cause a lot of times you just like, you just on, I think people that don't have pain in their life or haven't experienced enough pain to like come to the present moment, they're just on autopilot. And then, you know, when the world comes up and it says, Hey, I got this little problem, then they're, they don't even want to come to real life because they just would rather be on autopilot the whole entire time. And what's the fun in that? You know? Right. Yeah, and- that's so true. I don't know. I, I really, I agree. I think just thinking about how much I feel like I've grown in that sense Mm -hmm. makes me, makes me really agree with you, Austin, that previously I was on autopilot and I was just act react. So something bad Mm -hmm. happens, you react. You're like, this isn't, this isn't how it's supposed to be. This isn't like, I I was on autopilot. You messed me up. But when you're just, when you have that different perspective, and you're able to absorb and kind of marinate, then I feel like you're able to grow and you're able to kind of see the world for more of what it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. It's, uh, I mean, I don't know. And I I guess like, that's one big question that I always struggle with is like, why do people want to be on autopilot? Like what's the, the fun in that? And like, yeah, you're going to get some pain, but you're also going to actually live your life. Cause otherwise you're just on autopilot till you die. And I don't know, like, that's not something that I want to go the path that I want to go down. I want to take up and soak up every moment, whether it's like pain from a, a breakup or a loss or, you know, something that happened with like work or even like myself health related or anything like that. But then you get reap all the benefits of like friendship, family, love, you know, having success with your job. Cause like making, taking those opportunities to make those, take those chances and and create those possibilities, you risk it all, but you can get it all. And I don't know, that's, I don't, I, I'm really fascinated by neuroscience and I love that you study it and I can always like lean on you to get that information. But like, it's, it's just, I think I don't want to say like I'm too old to study it because that's not true, but it's um, not something I ever felt called to, to be that scientific and research and understand. And I'm glad that I have a family member that is doing that stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. And I'm curious, kind of going back to what you were saying about those people that don't want that. It's almost like it's obviously an easier way of living but it just makes me wonder even evolutionarily why is it some people's just like human nature to be on autopilot yeah and i don't know the answer to that but i almost feel like pain suffering growth perseverance creates success and i think it's kind of it's a different differentiating factor between the people that are going to live until they die on autopilot and the people that are going to going to live and are going to succeed and are going to grow. Mm -hmm. And I always think back to kind of like stories of people that are dying and it's not until then that they get out of autopilot and they're like, shoot, what have I been doing my whole life? (laughs) And I, I don't know. I feel like that's an encouragement for me to not ever feel that way. I mean, you're going to have your good and bad days, but I always want to at least be headed in the right direction. Yeah. Would you feel comfortable if we talked about like dad passing away? Yeah. Okay. Um, So do you feel like that was a wake up call for you? In a way, Mm -hmm. which is unfortunate, but I feel like I was at a weird turning point where I was something horrible happened, but also I was kind of getting out of that teenage brain where all the stupid stuff mattered. I was a scene. I was becoming a senior in high school. It was one of those where it just, I don't know. I think it all kind of happened at once. And I really feel like that was a turning point where, and mom and my mom and I have talked about this before, where it's like nothing, you know, when something really matters now, you kind of have, you have that in mind. And I feel like you have this reference point 
where Mm -hmm. it's like it's not that bad keep pushing it could be worse and sometimes I feel like in some ways that might be a toxic way of thinking if sometimes you do need to marinate and be like this sucks I have to accept it I want to think through this I don't want to just push past it but I think most of the time it's good to have that kind of reference point and be like I know what real pain feels like you know what I mean yeah well I think it's to be with that pain too because I I think you you soaked it in better than any of us and like sat with it where I just like went heads down and I was like, I got to take care of the business. I got to take care of all these things. And I just repressed all of my emotions. And it wasn't until like two years later where they all came up. And like, that's when I started going to therapy and seeing a psychiatrist and going on antidepressants and actually dealing with that stuff because it was important for me to like go back and I've written like several letters to dad, like talking about all the things that I miss and, you know, where I'm at now. And I feel like I've just had a lot of like really mystical moments that allowed me to be with that moment that had passed where I, I pushed it away because I wanted to be on autopilot in a way. I wanted to like put my head down and have success in business and make, you know, I forget what it was like, uh, six figures and, and I got there, but once I got there, I realized that that was so empty and so unfulfilling, unfulfilling that it's like, it made me stop and be like, okay, what's actually important. And I look back and, and that there was that. And like, that was important to me and you guys were important to me. And this organization is important to me to really promote wellness and like a holistic perspective too. So, so do you think that, so your t- turning point was almost later than, do you think? Two years later, I'd say like, <laughs> I don't want to say like the New Zealand trip where everything I felt like melted. Um uh, <laughs> But it was, uh, I think the the big turning point for me was going to New York and just all the constant change. It just made me sit with myself and being by myself the whole time that all these problems just came up to the top. And it's like, if I don't deal with this, there's going to be something that's bad that's going to happen. And so I, you know, I sought proper help, went to a couple different therapists. I went to uh, a psychiatrist and then I, you know, leaned on friends and family. And it wasn't until my coach that I worked with that really helped me get out of that spot and give me the tools to lean into to pain and be in the present moment because I was resisting it every day. Like I didn't want to be in it. And then I just went on this like magical trip buying crystals and doing Reiki (laughs) sessions, going to different concerts and like just (laughs) sitting in the park and just laughing my ass off because the pigeon dude had 30 pigeons around him and he had poop on his chest. (laughs) What? So it was just like, then I just saw everything as like a magical moment. Did you buy a bicycle too? I, I, I mean, I thought about buying a bicycle but then this little puppy had this uh, skateboard and it was rolling around on it. And I was like, man, I should get a longboard. So I got a long. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. And I feel like that just goes to show sometimes it feels easier to be on autopilot, to put your head down, but long-term it's not. You need that mm-hmm. strain. You need to face it and you need to, push forward and i don't know i think i i think that's just super important in any sort of situation well it's kind of like it just reminds me i had this one time where i was in walmart and this this lady had a squeaky wheel on her cart and she just lost it and i just started laughing i was like wow people will trade a a great life to try to have a good day And instead of just taking it for how it is 
not trying to change every single moment and just pushing on knowing that there's going to be like one, this could be your last day, but if there's another day, you're going to make sure it, it's going to be a good one. Cause you're not trying to save it all for today and trying to soak up every single moment. You're just going with the flow. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. I don't know. Well, all right, we'll get out of this rabbit hole. <laughs> Sean, what questions? I was letting you questions? go, baby. Yeah. What other questions do you have? That was a good one. Um, I mean, just to kind of, I guess, piggyback off of that, you know, like the idea that your perception influences your reality and, you know, your perception being a function of your knowledge base and your understanding of the world and also your experiences with the world. Right. And like, again, Maddie, you're the expert here. I'm just kind of spitballing, but you know, it, it makes me think of, um, did you guys ever hear about that case where that kid in Texas stole his dad's car, like ran over three people, killed three people, like drove drunk, all that stuff. And that his court defense was affluism. So he was so rich and privileged. He had no idea that that was wrong. And he never went to jail, never served one day in jail. Really? Nothing. Like he had no idea that that was not allowed because he had never been told no in his entire life. Right. It's crazy. And it's like, that's an extreme example. Sure. But like, you know, let's put it to the middle, you know, like if, if I'm, you know, or one, you know, towards the other end, right. I mean, I don't know what the other, the other end would even be starving kid in <laughs> Africa has the, the ultimate win here. Yeah, yeah. You know? I'm probably like centered that way, but like, you know, put it to the, the average person, right? Like if you have no sort of frame of reference of like shit is kind of hard in other places, right. Then you never have any need to grow or change or do anything else. Cause it's just this, you know, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to worry about it. You know, it almost like, it almost makes me wonder if it doesn't have something to do with like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. Like we're like, you've always, you're always in the middle, right. You've always got, you know, your basic stuff. You never had to worry about any of that stuff. So there was no need to like worry about the top levels. Cause you're just, you're here and you're good. You're staying there. Right. Versus like someone who didn't have, I mean, what's, what's the lowest level. It's like shelter or whatever. Um, like if you never had that, then it's like, well, shit, I got to get that. And then once you get that, it's like, okay, I got to get the next one. I got to get the next one. I got to get the next one. And that's how you grow. You know, I, I wonder if it's a, you know, a, a cognitive thing, but also like a, just, it's a, a mental thing just because of your perception, you know? Yeah. And I almost feel like there could be th that kid that you're talking about could be listening to this and thinking like, what's the, what's the point of perseverance what's the That's point what of dealing with pain you know and so are you asking like the people that don't have this perspective where they want to kind of deal with all aspects of life like where are they headed or what are you asking i don't know that i had a question there if i'm being honest <laughs> <laughs> well i guess i guess i don't know i was thinking like that's a really good point. And it, it's something that I hadn't really thought of before, but it's like, it's something that I juggle with in a way because being cognizant of the fact that people don't always think the way you do and maybe don't have the resources to makes you oh. want to be a more uh, empathetic person. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, to at a certain point, you have these basic responsibilities as a human where it's like you expect someone to respect someone else like you kind of have by default everyone sort of has these expectations for other people and it's really hard to balance that because it's like you have to understand that someone might come from somewhere of ultra privilege or the exact opposite and they don't have those resources and, and I feel like that's something to juggle with because I don't know. You, you never want to put expectations on someone, but we, we do it by default. And I feel like Austin, you've talked about this before, but it just happens. It's really yeah. strange. It's really hard to be just completely open to that person. You know, one, especially, especially if, them. what, yeah. what you say? especially when you disagree with them for sure. And uh, I think it's even harder when you have, family or friendly history with them because they they are that person like you know sean you're my best friend but in a way you're stuck in my best friend that was my college roommate in the past like and i try to bring you to the present moment every time 
but I'll still have those like things that have happened in college that stay with me. And just like Maddie, like you're my sister. And, you know, as we were kids, there's triggers that are still there that I still react to towards you that have nothing to do with this moment now, but I still react to them just like, you know, I'm 12 and you're seven. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, no, exactly. And to bring it kind of to neuroscience, there's when we uh, are studying perception, we think of two things. There's yeah. always two things going on. There's what's called the incoming sensory stream. So what's happening right now? What's this person seeing? What's this person hearing? What's this person feeling? But then there's what's called priors. Everyone comes into a study or comes into a conversation with priors. They have prior experience of X, Y, Z and everyone's varies. So it's, it, that's something that you, like I said before, you kind of just have to hope, like you can't do anything about priors and you can't really investigate them unless like that's something you're particularly interested in, like individual differences in people. Mm -hmm. But naturally, everyone has priors that's going to change the way they react to whatever perceptual experience you're giving them. And that just kind of goes along with the fact that you're going to have these triggers. You're going to perceive things differently. You're By nature, the way our brain's structured it's really hard to be open. And I, I don't even, I don't know. I don't necessarily think it's a fault to have priors because it, that's what we do. But I think being open enough to simply understand that everyone has different perspectives, I think is just, it's the best a lot of people can do. And I feel like that's good progress Yeah. because a lot of people that we know, even from Greenfield, Indiana, it's like, they can't accept the fact that someone thinks differently than them. And of course they're right. And of course the other person's wrong, but being able to say, okay, I don't know what's right or wrong. Obviously there's two sides, which means there's two perspectives. Mm -hmm. Just being that open, I feel like is what a good person has. And I really love when I see people that are super open-minded in that sense. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's kind of crazy too, to like go back to, um, the priors piece and, you know, all these triggers because in like this, you know, the spiritual path, like the responsibility of it is to, to bring awareness to it and not let that trigger inform you in the present moment. And I guess like how I do it is through emotion. So being in my body and when like I get angry because it's tax season again and I'm helping my mom and why am I angry at my mom? It's nothing to do with my mom at this moment. It's everything to do with previous, the previous events that had happened when I had to do taxes under a very stressed circumstance uh, after like the passing of, of dad. And so it's kind of crazy too. Cause it's, it's just, uh, you just, you, you're trying to fight your old you in a way, which is really cool. Cause then you're always growing. Like you're, un- you're shedding that skin of yesterday to step into today. And you're dying to the past in every single moment that that comes up. Um, I guess uh, I do. Let me. I had a question. Let me. Uh, and Sean, if you have one, go ahead. But I had another. Yeah, question. yeah, I do. Um, I, I kind of want to pivot it a little bit, I guess. Um, yeah. And this is me being selfish because I'm a physiologist. Um, but today we really talked about a lot of um, theoretical and conceptual, and you know, dare I say out here kind of stuff that's that's not necessarily tangible um in terms of the tangible and cognitive neuroscience what i guess what what are the biomarkers or the the ways that you guys are measuring certain things right because like as a physiologist like we're trying to discover the molecular processes by which things happen right and i'm a you know i do a little clinical stuff i do a little applied stuff i do a little functional i do a little unfunctional stuff um I've got some experience with MRI and fMRI. We're doing cardiac MRIs on all of our athletes right now. Um, I don't know if you ever get met um, 
Isaiah or who or Dr. Port or any of those guys over there in the neuroscience MRI lab, but we were working with them in my, um, my other job, my day job, <laughs> um, to do MRIs for the, for the athletes. But that that's actually a research, um, brain scanner 99% of the time. And so I feel like I've learned a lot of stuff along the way, but a lot of the stuff is like me looking at a sheet and going like, I, I, know, I know some of these words. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to do a study and you're going to look at something in the cognitive neuroscience realm. What, yeah. what are you going to do? Are we doing MRI? Yeah. We doing bloods? What are we doing? Right. So there's, I guess I'll kind of lay out what's available and then I'll talk more about what I've done. Um, there's fMRI, which was my primary focus as an undergrad. And then when, um, in Vanderbilt so far, I've done a little bit of EEG. It's been kind of hard because we're, we're in a pandemic. So I haven't been able to really face to face with people. Um, but a lot of times it's as simple as if you're looking at event perception, it's either fMRI or eye tracking. Um, and then there's the other aspects of like reaction time responses, et cetera. But the, like the big dogs are fMRI, EEG and eye tracking. And for example, when I, um, as an undergrad, I did my thesis on what I called the authorship effect in handwriting. And so I was trying to look at the neural basis of what happens when you see your own handwriting versus that of someone else's. So that probably doesn't sound super interesting, but basically like, is there a difference even, first of all, like, would you, because for me, what really sparked this question is when I would look at, like, you have that moment of, oh, that's me. That's what I did. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what is that? And I think that kind of ties into the mind brain because it's like, so I'm consciously saying that's mine, but what's happening in the brain to kind of signal that? So when you're looking at fMRI, and I'm sure you know this, but basically it's called the bold signal. So blood oxygenated uh, level of what kind of, how much oxygenated blood is going to specific aspects of the brain. And, um, and I think that's super cool. You can do so much in fMRI. I mean, when it comes to cognitive neuroscience, you're just showing stimuli or you're, we're even able to ask people to do tasks now, which was really hard before because of movement. So it messed up the pictures, but um, you can ask people to do tasks like writing is what we did. You can ask people to speak. Um, we even put four and five-year-olds in the scanner, which is nearly impossible, but we did it <laughs> because they don't stay still. <laughs> Roman. <laughs> yeah. And I know even... Um, Someone, I think it's at Dartmouth, they put dogs in fMRIs. Oh, which is really? Off topic, but I don't know what they're figuring out, but I think that's pretty cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I focused a lot on fMRI, um, EEG, and eye tracking is what I'll be doing mostly at Vanderbilt. But um, I think all of the above are really cool because I agree with you, Sean. I can only talk so much about these more abstract ideas. What I really find interesting is pairing these abstract ideas with something super tangible. Mm -hmm. So saying, oh yeah, you get this feeling when you see your own handwriting, but what is that feeling? Like we can figure that out. What's happening in the brain that occurs when you're looking at your own handwriting versus that of someone else's. Yeah. And I mean, just to finish that off, what I found out is even when you're not consciously aware that you're viewing your own handwriting, you actually have different neural activity. So it's almost, it's kind of what's called this novelty effect. So you actually show greater activation in the brain when you see someone else's handwriting than when you see your own, if mm -hmm. you're not consciously aware. So you're seeing two different words, I guess, or letters but the one that's less familiar to you sparks more activation. Even though you're not aware it's your own handwriting, it's something that you're more familiar with. So it will produce like less activation. Um, hmm. it, it's pretty interesting, actually. Does that go back to that autopilot thing where it's like 
you're used to this and this is your norm and you know this is this is home and comfortable and then this other thing is new and scary and oh what, the, what, what is that like you know right yeah I mean that's basically it so it sparks more activity just because we can only perceive so much at one given time and so it's this novelty effect in the sense that something more novel is going to by default spark more activity in the brain which you're right it kind of goes back to the fact of you need stimulation, you need change. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. Interesting. So I guess like, did it, did you study anything else or anybody else in your, in your lab study anything with handwriting? Like, like any, it was any benefits there? This is a good, yeah. So, you know, look, I'm going to show you, look, I'm I'm almost 30. Okay. We got this, this handwriting book (laughs) because mine is garbage. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I write stuff and I can't even read it. And it's mine. I, t- I told him he's a what? doctor. That's what he's supposed to do. <laughs> like it's horrendous. My boss is an MD and his is easier to read than mine. I can read his better than my own handwriting. Wow. I would love to put you in the scanner and figure out what's going on. That's no, you really wouldn't. interesting. You'd, be like, you'd take me out and I'd be handcuffed immediately. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this person's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So I we didn't look specifically at like quality of handwriting, I guess, which I do have a side note cursive or anything. So what we did, what we have found, or I guess Karen James uh, in the lab at IU, what she found was really that handwriting is crucial for brain development in children, not necessarily Hmm. cursive, just handwriting in general, because there's this like, (laughs) there's this like visual, motor activity that goes on especially for children but I'm, I'm sure that applies to adults like if we I don't know what would happen if we just stopped writing but I'm sure a lot of people have mm-hmm. um basically and this is this is more developmental so it might not be as much up your alley but I think this is super cool so when you're writing every time you write an a it's going to look different right oh yeah variability especially in children leads to better categorization so what they found is say you showed the same picture of a duck for example or you could say a tree whatever you want just an object the same picture a hundred times say you showed a hundred different pictures of a duck yeah. The person that saw the variability is more likely to accurately categorize than the person, even if they see that same, the hundred and one duck, they're less likely to accurately categorize that. And it's, we don't fully understand it, but it, it's basically just saying that variability leads to better categorization, better learning processes, uh, better reading processes. Like it's, and so for handwriting, it's really important to have that because it's, it's just key for children. Really. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Uh, they saw a duck a hundred times and they don't know it's a duck. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. it, it makes sense. It makes That's sense. That's a little extreme, but you know what I mean? So it, cause it's, this goes back to like what I, mean, I do. Flashcards ain't shit, Austin. No, this goes back to what I do every day. It's uh so machine learning and data science. Like to teach a computer, you show it so many variations of a duck or the letter A and the better it improves. But if you show it the exact same thing, it only has one thing to go off of and one thing to to compare that to, which is really cool. So I guess like my question is like, how does that benefit us? So if I journal every day or if I write everything in a notebook rather than typing it on a computer, because the computer would just show it being the exact same thing. So there's no inherent benefit to do your to-do list on a computer or to journal or your thoughts or feelings on a computer. So I guess what is the benefit of us writing in a journal every day or every once in a while? So I think when it comes to categorization and learning, that's less of a factor for adults. But what's still important and still applicable is this visual motor component. Okay. So when you're you're writing, your motor function is being paired with your 
with your visual system because you're seeing yourself write the words that you expect to come out from the motion you're creating. Okay. And so the benefit in handwriting in general is honestly just better memory because huh. it, it really, the variability doesn't come into play, but I, I have as adults, but as children, it does for learning. But so I would just say flashcards, Sean, that's why it works because I wrote it on a flashcard. <laughs> Well, yeah. So basically like, and I even feel like I noticed this. And I, flipped you off. <laughs> um, uh, I even feel like I, I notice it. I mean, as much technology as I have now, I mm. will always put my to-do list on paper. I, for some reason, it just does not feel the same. And I think that really comes from this visual motor component in our brain. And it's re it really is important and it leads to better memory. It, it just, it, it helps. Uh, and I think, I think that's kind of interesting where handwriting for adults and handwriting for children has different benefits, but I find it fascinating that still, even as adults, handwriting is beneficial. Yeah, that's crazy. So I guess like when we think about the future, and more and more kids are going to like computers and typing. Do you worry about kids in the future and learning and categorizing things properly or? Yeah. That... So, right. I mean, what my, uh, what Karen James had always said is like, it, it has such a core development for children and not just the fact that they can write their letters, but it leads to all these things that I'm talking about. And I think that that's something that's just purely missing mm -hmm. when it comes to technology. I mean, I don't think there's something that can replace it. Um, they've done studies before on like different effects tablets might have, and they didn't find that that decrease like the categorization ability, like writing on tablets, but it's still this physical act yeah. that you're doing. And that's just irreplaceable when it comes to the comparison between typing and, and I obviously typing super important. Like you wouldn't want to say, Oh no, no typing till you're in high school or something. <laughs> but I think what's crazy is um, there's been um, like state legislations that try to, I mean, eliminate curse cursive, which we haven't found any, we don't study cursive at, uh, in Karen's lab, but just, eliminate the um, curriculum for handwriting practices. So I think they tried to do it where it was only like kindergarten and first graders they taught handwriting. And then the rest was, I mean, just different resources. Like, and that's the thing too. Some schools have a computer for every kid while some schools don't. Oh yeah. And so that leads to a difference as well. But I think regardless, it's super important to hang on to handwriting. Just the fact that and I really find the whole categorization thing interesting. Like it's super cool to me because you think of all the things we need to categorize and all the different properties that make up even a letter. I mean, especially a tree or a duck, but even a letter. Yeah. And being able to make those distinctions and kind of, I almost feel like it's a, a restructuring of the brain in a sense where when it comes to how we think of things because mm -hmm. we can't hold a memory for every single individual item categorization is necessary for us to be able to like learn and understand things place things in boxes in certain yeah. in a certain sense hmm. and just trying to bucket it and kind of move on and get to uh i don't know it's it's kind of crazy too because like it's funny that we connect on two different sides, one on data science, which I feel like, you know, you think of machine learning and neural networks where neural networks try to emulate the brain and how it works because there's this process um, for neural networks that not all of the quote unquote neurons have to fire to get to the right answer. And so then they do this like efficient process where the, the neural network learns 
by having all these, you know, categorizing ducks to see, you know, okay, there was a green square in the top right corner, or maybe there's this curvy line here. And so it starts to build out these patterns and categorization, kind of like what you're talking about to properly, you know, categorize it and predict what is in front of it. So it's, mm. it, it's really pretty cool. And then to go on the other side is this like less tangible area where you get, um, the, the questions from is like this spiritual aspect and asking those big questions. So it's kind of interesting, like, uh, like where we connect is like, I, I'm at the very bottom of like the, you know, the raw data and all of this and how it works and where it goes. And then the top of like asking the big questions and you're right in the middle, like trying to uncover it all and figure out how to get to A to Z and, um, and, and try to uncover, you know, that hidden path or how the brain works and ask those big questions, which I think is uh, really fascinating and really cool. Yeah. And I, I've kind of heard this analogy before, but even thinking of like machine learning as, as little babies, because yeah. babies <laughs> brains are working <laughs> at a crazy what did you say, speed. Sean? I can't hear you. That's how they take over. You guys know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they start small children. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny yeah no it's really crazy I and I feel like there's a bigger connection there than even what we're aware of now but I don't know it's all just so cool it's like it makes me wonder when machines can actually have feelings and values I think that's when it scares me otherwise it's just a to z you know I gotta I start at a get to z that's the only thing but when they have a motive <laughs> like people and that kind of gets me back to the, you know, consciousness. Why, where did we get our motive? When did we just like start being like, oh, we need to make money. We need to start getting big cars and big houses. Like when, what made us decide like, Hey, I'm not happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to show you my fridge. Right. And, and it's like, when did we get unhappy running around in little like skirts and trying to stab animals to eat every single night <laughs> i don't know that's what i'm thinking <laughs> i know i i really I do feel hard. like <laughs> oh, yeah. i feel like you could say like maybe my fat it's... ass chasing a gazelle <laughs> Come on. bro you'd make traps I, you'd be a trapper <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> but in turn in turn so <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, I think I was just going to say, like, I, I feel like you can explain that just in the sense that the m motivation is necessary, but all these extra things you're talking about is almost just a byproduct of evolution. Like, we, mm -hmm. we need to be motivated. I mean, we wouldn't survive if we weren't. Yeah. But wh when did all these, I don't know, external factors come into play the materialistic factors just not just being motivated to survive but me being motivated to thrive in whatever context you see fit as thriving yeah and i don't know i i do think that's interesting too yeah mm -hmm. i guess one last topic unless sean you gotta i've question. only got one more yeah <laughs> if you want to go ahead and go first man go ahead and Okay, so uh, how is Marlo superior to Travis? Marlo is her dog. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Real so question. And agreed. Travis is, is her boyfriend. <laughs> but I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just saying, how are how are dogs superior to humans? Because I felt like that was that was an underlying thing in in your in your answers. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, I could, I can tell you a quick story, actually. Yeah, let's hear this it. is all, Fair this enough. is all perspective. In my reality, dogs are superior to humans. And this is an anecdote to explain that I'm not kidding. So basically, um, my track coach, my old track coach, you know who he is, gotta love him. He, um, he calls me all the time and he called me and he's basically, he's very ill, which is not good. 
but I'm on the phone with him and he's telling me that he just found out that he may only have a few months to live. He, but few months to few years. So he has no idea. For some reason I was driving and I see two stray dogs on the side of the road and it wasn't the man talking to me about dying that put me in a panic. It was these two dogs that I could tell were injured that put me in a full on emotional roller coaster. Like I was driving to a coffee shop and I, I couldn't manage both of them. So I just kept talking to him. But the minute I got off the phone with him, I started crying about the dogs. Aww. I was like, oh, no, I didn't go save them. I got to go find them. So I was trying to do work. And then I slammed my computer shut and I searched for the dogs for like two hours. And I never found them, which makes Aww. me even more sad. But basically, I don't know. I think the purity in dogs is ju- just what makes them more superior. There's no ulterior motives. They may want food a lot, <laughs> but I think deep down their motivations are very obvious. They're not trying to hide anything from you and they're just all around more superior. <laughs> you guys know the uh, the Louis Simmons West Side Barbell quote about dogs? Uh, no. Like West Side Barbell is the most hardcore gym probably in the entire world that, that may maybe challenge or whatever uh but the the mascot of it is a pit bull named nitro and they asked louis simmons who's like like yoda of powerlifting. And they were like why why a dog you know why are dogs your mascot and he goes well think of it like this you can lock your wife in the trunk of your car and you can lock your dog in the trunk of your car and if you unlock the trunk an hour later your wife will be pissed but the dog will be happy to see you <laughs> <laughs> oh that's terrible <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <So> funny <laughs> it's horrible but tell me tell me he's wrong you know what i'm saying uh, yeah uh, yeah uh, he's uh, not wrong yeah. about well, that but i mean i, I just ruined get, your whole story i apologize i get i mean i get pissed when they kill a dog in a movie i'm like why do right. they have to do oh that like i don't understand like they could they could kill any person i'm like whatever you know they're gonna probably die anyways but I don't know. yeah they deserve no it. exactly it's like what's the point why would you have to do that why would you well, have to piss everybody off <laughs> it's kind of like this karmic thing where people you can validate it in your head and you're like hey they deserve it and then for dogs you're like never they never right deserve it. <laughs> right and that's the thing i think so my track coach i should have mentioned this he's like 90 years old hmm. so it's time to go eventually but these dogs it just made me think of marlo who i rescued i was like shoot that could have been marlo and he needs help and no one's gonna do it you can't expect anyone to do it by yourself but i screwed it up so next time i will not let jerry get in the middle of it (laughs) that was a that was a big predicament you know that's like two major emotional roller coasters at once yeah, it only, was super overwhelming. You can only ride one roller coaster at a time. That's the hard part. <laughs> I know. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Man. That's nuts. Uh, so my uh, my question has nothing to do with puppies, uh, be forewarned. Um, <laughs> mine is, uh, you up for a challenge? Oh, gosh, maybe. Okay, so here's Dr. <laughs> Lee. I've got a case study for you if you're ready. All right. Okay. All right. Got a, let's say male, let's say 29, let's say has some trouble with handwriting. It's not me. Calm down. Um, Does he wear glasses? Maybe. And he might like black <laughs> from Redcon one. <laughs> BT dub. Um, shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> so when, whenever I'm, or he's writing, um, <laughs> when he writes he writes out like like let's say he's going to write out a word right like word w-r-d he is actually going to think about each individual letter of that word while also thinking about the rest of the sentence and the structure of the sentence as he actually writes out w-o-r-d not word w-o-r-d 
And as he goes to the O to the R to the D, he actually thinks about the entire sentence and restructuring the sentence and actually the paragraph that the sentence is going to fit into and how that can be structured as well. And then by the time he gets to the D, maybe he decided he didn't want to say word. Maybe he wanted to say something else in that place. And so word ends up with a T at the end of that bad boy because he was thinking the word instead. Is there any hope for me for him if that's how he thinks whenever he's writing to make his handwriting better? Because otherwise it's just going to end up as all scribbles. Hmm. Number one, is he crazy? Number two... <laughs> I feel like I would never say you're crazy or you have a problem. He, I don't know. He. Oh yeah, this person, this mysterious person. <laughs> but it makes me wonder because to be honest, I feel like at this point, the, the letters themselves should be automatic. The word, not necessarily automatic, but for sure, you should be thinking about the future of your sentence. But I feel like you shouldn't be thinking ab- consciously, at least, about each individual letter. And I feel like if you're doing that, maybe you're thinking too hard. But it sounds like maybe you're doing the opposite. Or he, this person. There you go. He. I, I what if think... he also does it when he speaks? And that's why he stutters sometimes. Because he's thinking mm. about changing the sentence. Like, like so, drop the BS. I literally think about every single sentence I say before I say it. And sometimes I repeat it back to myself after I say it. I just let him Whoa. rip. <laughs> yeah. Wrap your mind around that one. <laughs> like that's how I remember See, shit. So well. But how do you, how do you speak so fast? Like you're a fast talker. Yeah, dude. It, I, your guess is as good as mine. So hmm. you have the same issue speaking as you do writing. Yeah, so it's got to be a way that my brain just works, right? Yeah. But do you find it because you're overthinking? Or do you think it's just by nature the way your brain is working? Like, do you find yourself like like overthinking? I I feel like you wouldn't do that with writing. But sometimes I do that with speaking. I'm thinking too much. And kind of like what I was saying, I feel like, and I've always wanted to look into this, but... I feel like there's things that are meant to be automatic Mm -hmm. and there's things that are meant to not be automatic. And I feel like sometimes when you take away the automaticity of, for example, speaking. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks. Now I'm going to mess everything up. You (laughs) take away the automaticity of speaking or writing. That's when you mess up because Mm -hmm you almost have, you have muscle memory for those things. So you need to rely on your subconscious in a sense. And by bringing it into consciousness, you're, you're not doing it the way you should be. I don't know. And I, I find myself, I was talking with someone recently about, uh, and I just did it. Now I'm going to think about it. Utterances. So, um, uh, like, yeah, when you think, about it too much then it just happens way too often because you're overthinking it but utterances are fine naturally they're kind of communication signals saying like something tricky is coming up or something i'm unsure about is coming up so there's by default it's not a problem but once you bring it like once you bring it into manual then i feel like there's an issue that comes up so i don't i don't know it makes me wonder if there's some sort of practice you can do just trying to not think about it. But sometimes when you're told not to think about something, you think about it even more. (laughs) Right. Because like talking about utterances, I had this professor, actually my advisor in grad school, when we would give presentations, he would actually count the number of ums because he didn't want us to do that. Yeah, I was going to say you're really good at that. I've gotten compliments from you, Sean, about how you don't, use any utterances which is really impressive I feel like i either don't at all or i'm like uh like yeah, yeah, yeah. So little little like this da, 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 da. Yeah. yeah i say like a lot <clears throat> i just i think it's interesting the way that like people articulate different things you know even when writing and and, and you know it's crazy that the way that I do it is different because I don't want to misspeak and I don't want to double speak. And I, I try to make sure that what I say now is going to make sense at the end of the sentence, just like the beginning of the sentence. 
And then I also read it back to myself basically to make sure that I didn't have any mistakes. Now I did make a mistake. I'll try to correct it in the next sentence, you know? So I'm mm -hmm. constantly thinking about like my, I guess my own articulation of things and trying to get my point across maybe because I just like to argue. Um, <laughs> but I do kind of the same thing whenever I write, you know, I, it comes across as like, if I'm writing out this stuff, like I'm, I'm writing in the letters because if I don't think about the letters, I'll write something totally random. But by thinking about the letters, I can kind of skip the sentence and I can think about the bigger picture as I write out the letters. Whoa. So I can sort of restructure it as I go. That's really interesting. I can't tell if it's necessarily a problem, but it seems like you have issues with it on occasion. It's not necessarily a problem until I go to read back what I wrote and I'm like, what does that say? So you're saying that you don't catch the mistake in the moment because there's times where I'm thinking about the next word and I did put the T when I was thinking about writing the, but I was supposed to be finishing word or something, mm -hmm. but I catch it immediately. It's just no, interesting to me that you don't catch it. No, no, not even until like I go to read. I could, I could be like another paragraph it's down and come back up and be like, because you're on the next word you're already there yeah like, my brain like honestly thinks faster than i can write or speak well it's funny because i can do that with bitch. typing but writing I, I slow down like i i'm very connected to my pen to pen to page to brain where typing is just letting it all out and then going back and looking at all the red lines because word was like hey <laughs> these are all, all right. wrong <laughs> well maybe and this might be what you do Austin but I'm thinking about my own practices and because it almost part of it sounds like you're thinking too fast but then part of it sounds like maybe you're just not in the right flow I don't mm. know what I do is I slowly say in my head the words that I'm writing so, and I feel the same way. Sometimes I'm like, my brain's going way faster, but I feel myself being slowed down by my writing. So maybe mm -hmm. try just slowly, even to yourself saying exactly what you're writing. And then you're bringing each individual letter into a word. And then I feel like you have more of a flow in that way. That's, no, that's what important. I do at least. That doesn't piss uh, you off. That you have to write like, slower than you can think. That bothers me so bad. Yeah. But when I get, if I'm that annoyed by it, I'll just type like Austin mm. said, because sometimes I'm like, I, sometimes I really want to be in that moment because you kind of should slow down sometimes like meditation, of course. But, and I feel like that's what, when writing helps me journaling. I do better on paper because I'm forced to slow down and really think about everything I'm saying. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if it's just something quickly, I'm trying to take notes in class or something. It's just easier for me to stay on track by typing because I'm a lot faster. Mm. Yeah. That's why I like to dictate stuff. What? Because then I just dictate it like to like to your phone. Oh, just... I thought you were telling your intern. <laughs> That's what no. I was thinking. <laughs> no, Car Carly and uh, Carly and Brandon don't write for me. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, intern. <laughs> write down all my thoughts. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> that's what. No, Sorry. That's like, well, you know, you guys talk about like like journaling and stuff. And Maddie, we're just kind of rambling here. I, I want to respect your time, so if you got to go, you can go. But <laughs> you know, okay. my, you guys talk about you want to slow down, really think about it, put pen to paper, and write what you want to write. I'm more of like a let me just speech to text this and make a file this big on my iPhone. And then I can read that back to myself and I can actually like process it once it's all out. Oh, well, that's kind of how you tactic. speak and write though, too. Cause that's what you're saying. You like to <clears throat> reprocess where I feel like Maddie and I are processing as we go when we're in our, we're trying to understand our emotions and ourselves where you like to reprocess. Really interesting. Yeah. And I think that could almost go with when you're trying to text someone. So when you have to type it out, it's usually shorter than if you were to dictate it. So you're going to say, yeah, so this is what I want to do today. And then blah, 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 blah. I feel like when I actually have to think about it, it's more condensed and it's, I don't know, it just seems like more of a 
a summary, I guess. And I, I feel the same way when I'm writing, I'm, I'm slowly thinking through it. And I do feel myself kind of revising as I go before I even write it down. <clears throat> See, now you guys are going to write stuff and think about it the entire time. Like, man, this motherfucker was right. <laughs> <laughs> You've ruined it. <laughs> I just, I, I don't know. I feel connected when I write. I love it. Especially after I meditate. Cause then I have all these emotions uh, and I, uh, I realized like, this is the thing I need to deal with and it's clear and now I can deal with it externally. Mm. And I could go into a whole tangent on duality and reality and non-reality. But I, think I don't we're know. Gonna have to have Maddie back on and talk about meditation too. Have, have you guys ever seen Accepted with Justin Long where he makes the fake college, the South Harmon Institute of Technology? Yeah. No. It's like he couldn't get into college, so he makes it. Anyways, it's a really good movie. You should watch it. It's hilarious. Um, it's okay. got uh, Jonah Hill back when he was like fat, like in the very beginning. Oh. Um, and uh, there's this one, one of the girls makes this class called like nothing. It's on like meditation, just like just chilling and doing nothing. And there's this guy who sits down and he's like, oh, can I join the class? She's like, yeah, just have a seat. And he sits down for like two seconds. He goes, oh, that was great. I'll see you next time. And he like runs <laughs> off. That's it. All right. <laughs> That's you guys so are like, oh, funny. I love to meditate and think about stuff. And I'm like, like, like for like five minutes, <laughs> 20 minutes a day, baby. <laughs> it's actually weird how difficult it is. You just wouldn't really think it'd be difficult to kind of sit with yourself. And so many sit. people can't. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I struggle with it. It's really hard. It's just, I don't know. And I mean, we could talk about this forever, but it's like sometimes it feels easier to be on autopilot because then you're kind of numb to it all, like we mentioned before. Yeah. But it's just not good for you. Well, and I think it's, oh gosh, then we could even go left brain, right brain, where your left brain is your analytical and your speaking, you know, center. And we spend, you know, 90, 95% of our day in that center. And we don't really give time to our creative side. At least I'll say us, there's a variety of other people that spend more time in their creative and feeling centers. Um, and so we just lean on that left side. So when we do something that's on the right side, like creating music or meditating or doing something spiritual or writing or anything with creativity or, or emotions in general, it's hard for us to feel comfortable in that because we're not used to it. And it's, I don't know, it's so wild. And I'm sure yeah. you have a lot of studies about left brain, right brain that you could talk about too. And uh, well, I honestly haven't done as much research on that and I don't know how, because the thing is there's like structuralism and functionalism, which is basically saying this area of the brain does this. Mm -hmm. And that's not always the case actually. And I'm sure there's like left and right brain dominance, but yeah. I think, I think it kind of comes back to like putting it all together. Like what can stimulate you the most? And I, I feel like the creativity aspect I lack so much and I really need to work on it but I do feel when I do something like that I feel that stimulation and it it, it it's awesome but I don't know I haven't found the thing that is creative that gets me going so I'm still working on it finding your creative outlet there you go boom well Maddie we'll wrap this up do you have any like last pieces of advice that you give to people Mm. give us a cool quote or cool quote cool or quote. resource okay um oh, man i'm not good at this stuff um i think i wrote this in the little thing you sent and i feel like it's really important just simply stay curious and i feel like that can be expanded in so many different ways but like don't be married to your ideas. Don't be married to even your opinions, your thoughts, mm. your yeah. like who you think you are. I think being open is the best thing you can do. And that's kind of, I feel like the theme of what our conversation was. 
Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. And I, I think a lot more people could do that. And I would encourage people to do that. It's beautiful. Yeah. Stay curious, stay neuroplastic, baby. There we go. (laughs) Boom. Expand the mind, expand the self. 